But yes, the title of the paper is Turing Deception. My name is David Nover, and uh, my co-author is Matt Giolino. Uh, we work for People Tech in Huntsville, Alabama in the United States. So the title really is uh, a take on the original Turing imitation game, which people are familiar with, sometimes called the Turing test. And we wanted to kind of evaluate that in terms of changes that really happened within la large language models within the last two months. So we'll be kind of focusing on OpenAI's chat GPT and trying to reevaluate the Turing test uh, as, a, as a modern benchmark. So, so the outline of the paper, uh, we're gonna give sort of an introductory problem statement, um, go through our approach, and then of course the results and conclusions and where we think this work might go. The problem we're really trying to solve is, is what you might call the classic grading problem. Um, we want to pass Alan Turing's original paper, which dates to 1950, in which he posed the question, can machines think? And we want to both analyze the human contribution that Alan Turing made uh, and also reproduce it as potentially convincing human level writing from a machine. So I think most people would concede even as short as a year ago, that was a pretty hefty lift. And I think now people are kind of getting a sense that uh, depending on your the strength of the Turing test, uh, it now seems surmountable. But the real question, which is a subsidiary that Alan Turing posed, it's not just can machines think, in other words, could they convince uh, a, a blind human through conversation that, um, that they were in fact impersonating a human, thus the name imitation game, but also how would you prove it? And I think that's kind of the more interesting part of the paper is, uh, what kind of metrics could you wrap around it? Some of them are classic writing style metrics, and some of them are more uh, kind of advanced tells that could describe, okay, this has some deeper pattern that we can recognize as machine driven. So uh, we'll go through the approach. We're going to reproduce Turing's famous meditation on the imitation game. Uh, we're going to make it as entirely machine written using chat GPT, which is OpenAI's release of G the generative pre-trained transformer 3.5. Um, and we're gonna compare it, classically compare and contrast machine and human writing for quality metrics. And an interesting aspect when you reread the 1950 paper is how much of it is posed as questions to the reader. And so because we have this new chat bot, if you will, uh, it's kind of right to pose Turing's test, which he used kind of as a rhetorical thing, but use it to answer his own questions. Um, on the right side, you do see Alan Turing. Uh, for people unfamiliar with him, uh, you know, he is rated as, as the 20th century's one of their 100 greatest minds, father of modern computer science. And the one I liked was a nature editorial uh, kind of commemorating his contributions in which uh, they kind of rate him in terms of types of intelligence. So obviously human, uh, he was very interested in psychology and how you would rate human uh, consciousness. Also artificial intelligence. And finally, of course, in some sense, memorialized by uh, the movie, uh, he contributed a great World War II and the Enigma machine. All kind of world changing. And I think you could look at of the hundred contributors in the 20th century, you have specialists in one or two of those, but not all three. So uh, the imitation game by name is deception. And I think uh, the purpose of the game is to explore whether machines can exhibit human behavior that is indistinguishable from that of a human. So it's essentially a faker. And you could envision some problems with that, uh, particularly why would we if we have this fantastic computer in front of us, why would the first question we pose actually be so negative? Um, in other words, uh, when you, and I'll describe this a little bit later in concrete terms, but um, the, uh, the need, as AI gets more and more advanced, the alignment problem to human desire sort of becomes more extreme. And as you get to artificial super intelligence or ASI, it becomes a real problem if, um, 
in at least in science fiction terms, if the computer really takes it on to deceive humans. So this is what the original 1950 paper looks like. Uh, I will say rereading it after what is essentially, uh, what is that, 40 plus six, 63 years, uh, it is very conversational. Um, he is writing it in a rhetorical fashion. We answer, ask a lot of questions. And um, to distinguish what essentially is, is, a, is the real Turing from the fake Turing that we're going to investigate, we will give what's a kind of an artist conception of, of Turing on the right to highlight what is clearly human written in 1950. Um, so a little background on the Turing test before we get to our contribution. Um, as it's kind of come down through various testers, it's a five minute keyboard conversation. Typically you have a judging panel and the computer, it, you ask, the judging panel to to assign whether through questions and answers and probing um, at least 30% of the time the human cannot distinguish is that written by a human uh, at a keyboard or is that machine generated behind a keyboard kind of the first notable attempt there the University of Reading in 2014 held a public event. Uh, sponsored by the Guardian and uh, the winner in that case did actually fool a judging panel 33 percent of that of the panel was convinced the machine was a human and the chatbot was called eugene Gustman, and it was uh sort of portrayed to the judges as this could be a 13 year old ukrainian boy and so that in some sense gave cover to the fact that um, if broken English or something like that became a tell. And see, some of these have evolved to quite sophisticated and short conversations. So for example, uh, asking a bot, you know, the square root of a very large number that typically a human won't calculate. And if the bot is not trained to filter that, it could answer quite quickly. And it would just simply, because of its super skill at math, uh, relative to human would reveal its identity. Another very specific kind of query that people have built over the years in these kind of back and forth cat and mouse games is to ask like, what's the 400th word in Shakespeare's Hamlet? And typically a, a large language model may know that, of course, human would not. Uh, four years later, the Google CEO uh, Sundar Pichai, Pichai said, uh, we need to make Turing test more sophisticated because they introduced a chatbot in a very big presentation in which they uh, used a phone call to set up a hair salon appointment. And um, at the time it was considered unscripted. I think it's later come out that there was some preset conversation that was going to go on between the appointment and the, and the computer. But basically the idea is uh, it could act as a personal assistant. When we reviewed the paper in 2022, there is, you know, a kind of convincing quote at the end that to date, no computer has decidedly passed the Turing AI test. Um, and so people, sometimes it's a moving target, people have kind of extended it a few times. A second level, which I referred to before, is what's wrong with the idea of constructing a deceptive uh, benchmark in a macro, in a sort of a macroscopic way, it's misdirected. Um, as AI gets more sophisticated, you could say it's not aligned to human interest. From our perspective, it's somewhat impractical in the sense that what I'm showing on the right here is the interface to OpenAI's GPT-3 API. And this sort of question and answer is really just one of the skills of 45 that are presented to the user. So why Turing himself really thought intelligence was a good conversation? Um, but clearly, in a modern machine sense, like summarizing complex medical documents or taking an English instruction to a, math, a map direction, uh, filtering toxic text, there's just a ton of coding examples that are just uh, somewhat mind-blowing in, in this version. So the idea of a good conversation is a somewhat limited view of what's in front of us. Um, and a particularly telling quote here about impersonating a human as a goal for an entire AI field is Turing sort of posed it not kind of because thinking 
was a conversation piece, but it was kind of, he didn't really want a pretender to be a chatterbox. And the quote in the paper is, you know, if you set out aeronautical engineering as a field to make machines that can fly so exactly like a pigeon that they could fool other pigeons, the point is to make something that flies, not something that acts like a bird. And so that's kind of goes back. I think it's a pointing way, pointed way of describing uh, the, the vast number of tasks that really have been presented to modern large language models. So to get to the chase, we, the paper describes three research tasks. We will uh, develop metrics to score Alan Turing in, in sort of a, a grammatical way um, a, as a human representative. And then we will show variations where we essentially recreate Turing's paper by either asking questions or asking it to summarize it in succinct ways. So that's the middle task. And then the final task is what I think people have really found fascinating about the chat interface is its ability to engage in conversations and you can press it uh, in the same ways that Turing proposed questions rhetorically. So I think what one of the interesting outputs of the paper is to answer some of his more hanging questions. Uh, an interesting Easter egg sometimes uh, missed in his paper is in 1950. And it sort of goes back to my, uh, if you were looking for a tell, if you're, if you're part of the judge and you pose a question to an advanced AI, um, uh, if it makes an error, it's a, it's a tell that it's a human. So interestingly enough, he posed one of the early questions, which is add two five digit numbers. And his paper never lets on that uh, this is an Easter egg, but the answer after 30 seconds is actually the wrong answer, which would in some sense give a machine should be able to answer that easily. It's hard for a human. In fact, we put, and this is a typical, maybe even a year ago, you could make a lot of these large language models look pretty stupid. I mean, you could essentially write two plus two equals. And because the large language model was trained on a lot of Reddit jokes uh, as uh, early days, you could actually get it to answer two plus two equals five because it was a punchline to an ongoing joke. Now the filter with a lot of human feedback, reinforcement learning, you pose the same question and it will in fact give the right answer out of the ballot. So that's kind of an emergent property of these large language models that um, it can do math. The other one, which I think was, is more of a tip of the hat to Turing, is he kind of scratched his head over a large, imagine encoding human knowledge as business rules. And so he used the example, which now is kind of a forefront of advanced AI, uh, give the instructions to drive a car and you know you sort of write those rules down and one of them is uh, to stop when one sees a red traffic light and uh, but there are many edge cases there where where essentially that is an that uh, would present you with some challenges so um, anyway this is the modern interface that is actually part of uh, 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 the test, the Tesla driving interface. So, how do we how do we evaluate the test quality? Um, it's a mixture of half readability. So, grammar uh, has a score either assigned to a grade level or one to a hundred. Based largely, these are triggered by the syllable, the number of syllables in the sentence length, the number of passive sentences. We will apply uh, Grammarly Pro, which is a, another AI model, which is, is syn syntax correctors. Um, so it has a very deep sense of uh, what's engaging or uh, is the delivery clear. Uh, and it also has a, a, an important metric, which is to compare it to 8 billion web pages as part of a database. And so it will give a plagiarism score and then finally give it a, 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 a uh, final rating. So uh, we're going to pass both the machine and the human through that. Sorry, I lost my mouse. All right, so this is the output that we did. Uh, to, to skip to the chase, uh, basically, uh, Turing's original paper scored 14% lower in overall Eng English written metrics than all of the machine versions. And so that's this overhaul score here. 
uh, uh, Grammarly Pro, which essentially now has shifted the Turing test to grade an AI with another AI. But it is an interesting metric uh, when you when you add all of these features up. Um, it gives it a, a higher score here is is better. So 63 versus 77 for Turing sum, summarization one. And I'll show you an example of that. The second summarization goes all the way up to 84. And then when we pose questions to it, you can get to 77. But at, at a core level, the machine can outright the human in this case, based on these inputs. Another interesting row here is um, Turing's original is, as you would hope, uh, uh, flagged as 100% plagiarized. Essentially, we did feed the metric, feed the original paper as text into it. So you want that. The interesting part is all of the machine generated ones are 99 to 98% original. And that's a little bit new. And that's not something that you would not expect to come out of, for example, uh, copy clipping a Wikipedia article, uh, et cetera. Um, if you look at why it's scoring uh, not so well, there, there are about 500 correctness alerts. So the syntax that Alan Turing wrote with um, will flag a lot of grammar errors, including uh, passive voice. So bottom line is this is the human. These are the three machine generated cases. And we're interested in some of the scoring here, uh, some of which is subjective, but it is repeatable in the sense of Grammarly Pro gives it to us. So this is what the AI grammar report gives to the AI generated text. And so it calculates a, a, a lot of things, wordy sentences. Uh, at one point, pronoun use was a real tell for machine written text. Um, so for example, it would use a lot of vague pronouns, like uh, it would repeat the question, uh, you know, what time is it today? Or what's the weather today? And it would say, the weather today is sunny. And then it would continue on from that thought with a impersonal pronoun like this. And so that you could actually make pretty dumb, I mean, I'll put it this way, pretty simple detectors of machine written language, basically by counting the number of does and this. Um, and this is the plagiarism detector. They found six sources that did have Turing's original paper cited. So what kind of, what is the real content of the machine generated output? Uh, we po it's important to imagine how you get it to generate text. Chat GPT has a pretty interesting prompt. So rewrite this paper in 10 paragraphs. And all of the first pass we did um, was just to give it a link to the PDF from Turing's paper. So we're not actually giving it much text other than it has to associate what that link includes and the command to rewrite it. And that was a little bit kind of jaw dropping. Uh, we know it's not going out to the web to spider that. Uh, it's just somewhere in its training data of 40 terabytes. It has seen that uh, reference and it knows sort of what the content of that is. And uh, we've highlighted, a, so this is the entire, so we've tagged this with the machine generated picture of Alan Turing, which is done by another AI model called Dolly2. But it does a very nice summarization. This would kind of be a Wikipedia quality summarization. Um, you know, it, it, it does capture the fact that Turing wanted someone, uh, essentially a conversationalist to engage in human level conversation. He does make a strong case that this would qualify. If you couldn't distinguish, the machine uh, might as well be intelligent. If it can simulate a human, uh, we don't know, really know enough about consciousness to make uh, the cut otherwise. And so that really said, so it does capture that it understands the imitation game. An interesting feature, which is gonna make it hard for some reproducible research is uh, uh, as in a separate session, we pose the same question. And in this case, maybe uh, the, the model picked up on rewrite it in 10 paragraphs, meaning summarize it. Instead, it just took the first 10 paragraphs literally and, and wrote a paragraph by paragraph summary. So in this case, uh, rather than the entire essay, 
it's going uh, sort of leapfrog first to second to third. So um, it, is, it is a challenge. There is still, I think, what I what you would call this fragility on the prompt engineering, uh, but it clearly is evidence of it thinking and engaging conver in conversational ways. So um, the second uh, major thrust was to flip his script, since ChatGPT really does have this ability to, to answer direct questions. We took his core thesis, Can Machines Think?, and asked ChatGPT to answer Turing as if it's conversing with him. And it really comes back with quite a, a I think, a, a, a wishy-washy answer. Um, you know, some people believe, other people be uh, don't believe. So this would kind of be like a, maybe a, a, a debater um, judge panel that would sort of say on the on the one hand, but on the other hand, and this is largely a fact that open AI has really filtered a lot of the responses to take out opinions. It becomes much more of a, I guess what you call a thesaurus or dictionary style answer here. Uh, second question is, uh, are there computers, this is asking, this is what Turing asked in 1950, are there digital computers that could do well in the game? And of course, from, um, from today's perspective, ChatGPT answers this, uh, yes. And uh, it, it is indistinguishable behavior from a human. Uh, a, a final test, which I think was really launched um, out of a Georgia Tech paper, which is another tip of the hat called the Ada Lovelace II test. And her, uh, the way that test works is uh, computer is deterministic, so it could never surprise us. The, 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 the language model could be complex enough that it wouldn't necessarily tell you how it got there, but it's not like it's inventing something like in a quantum leap. And so, the example they use for the Lovelace test, which is a carry on from the Turing test is, give it something outrageous that could never be in its training data. And so in this case, it's tell a story about a boy who falls in love with a girl, the aliens abduct the boy and the girl saves the world with the help of a talking cat. So the more absurd, the better. And of course, people have really uh, segued this a lot with the image generation side, but. This is the output of ChatGPT. It's a fairly decent once upon a time story with the talking cat. Uh, they fight and battle with the alien and eventually uh, we have a joke to sort of land it that it lend a helping paw when needed. So I would say, you know, if unless you're taking a completely deterministic materialistic view, this is capable of surprising humans. And I think it, um, you can ask 50, you know, 100 users uh, on Twitter, is it surprising? And they will, they will kind of answer yes, as a collective crowd. I think one of the most interesting things is to kind of riff with it. Um, and this is kind of a version of style transfer where the question is, write uh, an X about Turing's imitation game, where X you're gonna, in some sense, iterate the num styles of poetry. So there are maybe 16, official styles of poetry, epics, haikus, limericks, ballads, odes, quatrains. And it clearly is a kind of an expert and one of OpenAI's things, uh, and notable things is it encodes white space. So it actually will output poetry, not as a run on sentence. So uh, one of the interesting things we wanted to push it through and I'll close, uh, this is I think the second to last slide, is uh, can we detect machine, so all that looks impressive, but can we uh, detect machine written uh, text even when it's not obvious? So generally you, you can put it through uh, an online GPT-2 detector. It, it will score Tur uh, Turing's original as 99.9% .9 real. It will score all of our three cases, four cases, I guess, here of uh, machine written text as fake. Uh, it fails on the poetry test I just showed you. Uh, and it does uh, declare all the authorship of our particular paper as human written. So this is the outlier that essentially, um, we're not up to a third, fooling a third of the judges, uh, but this kind of flips the story. 
So can machines think? Uh, we did demonstrate a series of metrics. I think our interest is more, how would you prove it? Uh, Chatbots do have higher readability and you can prove statistically they can write clearer than Alan Turing. Uh, the task we demonstrated are to recreate the original paper, answer some of his hanging questions, and really pose the question to the community is, why in the world are we still chasing human deception as a modern AI goal? So with that, I'll pass it back to the group and thank you for your attention.